make up his mind what to buy with it, but it was hard to do. To the get the most for it was the idea. He knew that at the miner's restaurant he could get a plate of beans and a piece of bread for ten cents, or a fish ball and some few trifles, but they gave no bread with one fish ball there. At French Pete's he could get a veal cutlet plain and some radishes and bread for ten cents, or a cup of coffee, a pint at least, and a slice of bread. But the slice was not thick enough by the eighth of an inch, and sometimes they were still more criminal than that at the, in the cutting of it. At seven o'clock his hunger was wolfish, and still his mind was not made up. He turned, and out, he turned out and went up Merchant Street, still ciphering and chewing a bit of stick, as is the way of starving men. He passed before the lights of Martin's restaurant, the most aristocratic in the city, and stopped. It was a place where he had often dined in better days, and Martin knew him well. Standing aside just out of the range of the light, he worshipped the quails and steaks in the show window, and imagined they might be the fairy t that might be the fairy times were not gone yet, and some prince in disguise would come along presently and tell him to go in there and take whatever he wanted. He chewed his stick with a hungry interest as he warmed to his subject. Just at this juncture, he was conscious of someone at his side, sure enough, and then a finger touched his arm. He looked up over his shoulder and saw an apparition, a very allegory of hunger. It was a man six feet high, gaunt, unshaven, hung with rags, with a haggard face and sunken cheeks, and eyes that pleaded piteously. The phantom said, Come with me, please. He locked his arm in Bulcher's and walked up the street to where the passengers were few and the light not strong, and then facing about, put out his hands in a beseeching, sort, in a beseeching way and said, Friend, stranger, look at me. Life is easy to you. You go about placid and content, as I did once in my day. You have been in there and eaten your sumptuous supper and picked your teeth and hummed your tune and thought your pleasant thoughts and said to yourself, it is a good world. But you've never suffered. You don't know what trouble is. You don't know what misery is, nor hunger. Look at me. Stranger, have pity on a poor, friendless, homeless dog. As God is my judge, I have not tasted food for eight and forty hours. Look in my eyes and see if I lie. Give me the least trifle in the world to keep me from starving. Anything. Twenty-five cents. Do it, stranger. Do it, please. It will be n nothing to you but life to me. Do it and I will go down on my knees and lick the dust before you. I will kiss your footprints. I will worship the very ground you walk on. Only twenty-five cents. I am famishing, perishing, starving by inches. For God's sake, don't desert me. Bulcher was bewildered and touched too. Stirred to the depths, he reflected, thought again, then an idea struck him and he said, Come with me. He took the outcast's arm, walked him down to Martin's restaurant, seated him at a marble table, placed the bill of fare before him and said, Order what you want, friend. Charge it to me, Mr. Martin. All right, Mr. Bulcher, said Martin. Then Bulcher stepped back and leaned against the counter and watched the man stow away cargo after cargo of buckwheat cakes at 75 cents a plate. Cup after cup of coffee and porterhouse steaks worth two dollars a piece. And when six dollars and a half's worth of destruction had been accomplished and the stranger's hunger appeased, Bulcher went down to French Pete's, bought a veal cutlet plain, a slice of bread, and three radishes with his dime, and set to and feasted like a king. Take the episode all around, it was as odd as any that can be culled from the myriad curiosities of Californian life, perhaps. 
chapter 60. An old friend, an educated miner, pocket mining, freaks of fortune. By and by, an old friend of mine, a miner, came down from one of the decaying mining camps of Tuolumne, California, and I went back with him. We lived in a small cabin on a verdant hillside, and there were not five other cabins in view over the wide expanse of hill and Yet a flourishing city of two or three thousand population had occupied this grassy dead solitude during the flush times of twelve or fifteen years before. And where our cabin stood had once been the heart of the teeming hive, the center of the city. When the mines gave out, the town fell into decay. You found it? Good. And in a few years, wholly disappeared. Streets, dwellings, shops, everything, and left no sign. The grassy slopes, the grassy slopes were as green and smooth and desolate of life as if they had never been disturbed. The mere handful of miners still remaining had seen the town spring up, spread, grow, and flourish in its pride, and they had seen it sicken and die, and pass away like a dream. With it their hopes had died, and their zest of life. They had long ago resigned themselves to their exile, and ceased to correspond with their distant friends, or turn longing eyes toward their early homes. They had accepted banishment, forgotten the world and been forgotten of the world. They were far from telegraphs and railroads, and they stood, as it were, in a living grave, dead to the events that stirred the globe's great populations, dead to the common interests of men, isolated and outcast from brotherhood with their kind. It was the most singular and almost the most touching and melancholy exile their fancy can imagine. One of my associates in this locality for two or three months was a man who had had a university education, but now for 18 years he had been decayed there by inches, a bearded, rough-clad, clay-stained miner, and at times among his sighings and solo soliquizings he unconsciously interjected vaguely remembered Latin and Greek sentences. Dead and musty tongues, meet vehicles for the thoughts of one whose dreams were all of the past, whose life was a failure, a tired man, burdened with the present and indifferent to the future, a man without ties, hopes, interests, waiting for rest in the end. In that one little corner of California is found a species of mining which is seldom or never mentioned in print. It is called pocket mining, and I am not aware that any of it is done outside of that little corner. The gold is not evenly distributed through the surface dirt as in ordinary placer mines, but it is collected in little spots, and they are very wide apart and exceedingly hard to find. But when you do find one, you reap a rich and sudden harvest. There are not now more than 20 pocket miners in that entire little region. I think I know every one of them personally. I have known one of them to hunt patiently about the hillsides every day for eight months without finding gold enough to make a snuff box, his grocery bill running up relentlessly all the time, and then find a pocket and take out of it $2,000 and two dips of his shovel. I have known him to take out $3,000 in two hours and go and pay up every cent of his indebtedness, then enter, on a, then enter on a dazzling spree that finished the last of his treasure before the night was gone. And the next day, he bought his groceries on credit, as usual, <laughs> and shouldered his pan and shovel and went off to the hills, hunting pockets again, happy and content. This is the most fascinating of all the different kinds of mining and furnishes a very handsome percentage of victims to the lunatic asylum. Pocket hunting is an ingenious process. You take a spadeful of earth, 
from the hillside and put it in a lot.